This is gonna anger some of you. <laughs> this was a total lie. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpott and I cover true crime cases on my channel. Today I'm gonna be covering a very frustrating case. And when I say that, what I mean is nobody seemed to care about this girl. And I don't say things like that lightly. But before I get into it, quick little disclaimer. I do apologize if any of the information in this video is inaccurate. Everything I mention is just what I found online and I just put it all into one video. I do my best at fact checking, but you can't always be sure, unfortunately. All right, let's get into this video. So this is the case of Yasmin Akri. Yasmin was born in Kentucky on the 25th of October 1992 and she had an older brother called Demarcus. Um, pretty much from the get-go, she had a really difficult upbringing. Her mother, Joyce, was a drug addict to the point where she wasn't capable of providing them with the care that they really needed. So as a result of this, Yasmin and Demarcus were removed from the family home and they were placed into the foster care system. Unfortunately, they were bounced around quite a lot and with this came multiple types of abuse and with this came a number of behavioural problems that Yasmin had developed possibly as a coping mechanism because all of this was happening before she even turned six. After a few seemingly long years in the foster care system, Yasmin and Demarcus were put into the finally loving home of Rick and Debbie Keithley. Initially when they arrived there, Yasmin would swear a lot. According to Rick, it was F this and F that. She was only six. It just shows you a tiny hint of what she would have been exposed to at such a young age. And they actually had a farm with horses and livestock and this was in Junk City, Kentucky. So this actually then turned into a pretty wholesome childhood. The kids were taught to do farm work, Yasmin really loved the farm work, and Debbie and Rick really started to see themselves as the parents of Yasmin and Demarcus. So this arrangement went on for about three years and the kids started to overcome the behavioural issues that they had previously developed. And it's actually kind of unfortunate that it was only three years but Yasmin and Demarcus's mother Joyce wanted them to be raised by family so because of this they were removed from the Keithley's home and placed with an aunt. I don't know why the mother allowed them to be in the system for years like at this point it would have been maybe eight nine years and then she decided that she wanted them to be raised by family. I find that uh, unusual but also the fact that she even had a say in what was best for them and their care might be a little controversial considering she couldn't take care of them herself and you know chose drugs and like uh, it's a hard one because an addiction it's not a choice it's an illness like but still she had that altered mental state but ultimately this aunt didn't really want them she was kind of landed in it because she was past the parenting stage of her life. Her own daughter was an adult at this point and it seemed that she didn't necessarily want to start the whole parenting process again and she admitted that she was reluctant to take them. And even just from what I've told you so far, my heart already aches for these kids because nobody wanted them. Well, I mean, the Keithleys wanted them, but then in the end, they didn't get a say. They were the only ones that really did care for these kids and they were the ones that didn't get a say. Uh, into the living situation with this aunt. I didn't even tell you her name, by the way. Her name was Rose May Starnes, and she owned a two flat, like a duplex, in the 4800 block of West Congress Parkway, and this was in the Austin neighborhood of Chicago, which is apparently a pretty rough area, and I was curious, so I actually looked into the figures on this, and yeah. The total crime rate is almost three times higher there than the national average for the US. And the violent crime rate is almost five times higher than the national violent crime rate in the US. It's pretty bad. So Rose May also rented out the apartment on the top floor. And for a while she rented out the basement as well. But then after a few years, that ended up becoming Yasmin's bedroom. So Rose May worked nights and she did have a boyfriend that rented one of the apartments. And even though they were now with family, Yasmin and Demarcus's abuse was not over. Rose May whipped them with a belt on a number of occasions, as well as an extension cord. She would also lock them in the basement for hours at a time and occasionally withhold food from them. So because of Yasmin's difficult upbringing, she did have a therapist. And this therapist told Rose May that Yasmin was very troubled and she warned her she needed to always be with a trusted adult. 
So how much we know and trust Rosemary's boyfriend, I don't know. And all this time they did still have regular visits from social workers, but obviously Rosemary put on quite an act for them and they never really knew how bad the living situation actually was for the kids. But on top of that, there were family members that knew how Demarcus and Yasmin were being treated and they didn't speak up about it, not to Rosemary and not to the social workers. Everybody was just failing both of them. But because of Yasmin's abusive upbringing, she did have quite a few self-esteem issues and also issues with boundaries in terms of knowing what boundaries she should have to protect herself. She just lacked that true understanding of what was and wasn't okay for someone to do to her or in her presence or you know she didn't really get that because that boundary had just been broken so many times in the past okay so in 2006 rosemary actually officially adopted yasmin and demarcus and that meant that there were no longer social worker visits so even that one glimmer of hope <laughs> was stripped away. And at this time, a social worker wrote that it was absolutely necessary for a safety plan to be put in place, both for the protection of Yasmin against abuse, as well as the protection of other children, because Yasmin's behavior was kind of unpredictable. They were kind of worried about what she might do to other kids. And she also recommended that she get intensive therapy and mental health services. It is now the next day. <laughs> the camera died in the middle of filming a clip and I kept talking for another 30 minutes or so. So the following year in 2007, Demarcus left and he was only 16 years old. Now I do have to say, I did see a Facebook post from Demarcus himself saying that he ran away, but obviously there's no way to know if this was actually Demarcus. But then I also saw two articles saying that he was kicked out by Rosemary because he was causing so much trouble. But like either side of that coin, you can really imagine just how difficult that would have been for Yasmin. Throughout their entire upbringing, he was the only constant. He was the only one that was always there. And on top of that, they went through all this abuse over the years together and now he was gone but by 2007 despite her difficult home life both currently and previously Yasmin was doing pretty well she got really good grades she was a spelling bee champion she was about to start her very first job so this was all really exciting for her and like any teenager too she also decorated her bedroom with pictures and posters of celebrities and she also really enjoyed reading and writing songs and listening to music so this is an exciting time for her and it just goes to show like just how much potential she actually had because despite all this difficulty in her upbringing and her childhood she was starting to create this really fulfilling life for herself however it is important to note that her grades did start to dip as soon as she started high school okay so this brings us right up to her disappearance on the 15th of January 2008, Rosemary left Yasmin alone in the house with Charles Burt, Rosemary's boyfriend who rented a room in the house. He was a 58 year old car wash worker and also the last person to see Yasmin. By the way, something that is very important to note here, Rosemary had actually obtained an order of protection against Charles Burt because he allegedly hit her. That's definitely interesting, especially considering she felt comfortable enough to leave Yasmin alone with this guy. Anyway, on this day, Rosemary went to the Grand Victoria Casino in Elgin, or Elgin, I'm sorry, Illinois. This is about 45 minutes away, and she was going there to play some slots with her older daughter. So that day on the 15th, Yasmin spent a lot of the day at the local YMCA, and she got home at around 8 p.m. Everything was pretty normal. And it was the following morning then when Charles Burt took out the bins and he noticed something very strange. But in order for this to make sense, I basically have to explain the setup. So Yasmin's bedroom was in the basement, as we know, but she had obviously a door that led up into the house, but also a door that led to the outside. So there was this door and then on the outside of that, there was a scissor door and the scissor door was normally locked with a padlock. But on this morning, the 16th of January, 2008, the door was wide open. And when Charles took a closer look, he noticed that the padlock had been cut with bolt cutters and the door was busted open. He went back in then to take a look around for Yasmin to see if she was in there. Obviously she was not. And that's when he kind of thought, well, she's probably just gone to school early. What, why, why on earth would she literally break out of her bedroom, cut a padlock with bolt cutters and scurry off to school 
I've never wanted to go to school early that bad, <laughs> that's for damn sure. Like if she really was gonna go to school early, she could have just gone up the stairs and out the door that wasn't locked with a padlock. So that's a, a <laughs> weird assumption to make. Also, that would have meant that Yasmin would have had to have a bolt cutters in her bedroom. And I don't know about you, but at 15 years old, I wouldn't have known what a bolt cutters was, let alone have one in my bedroom. It's just a very strange piece of bedroom equipment. But regardless, Charles Burt thought it might be a good idea to let Rosemary know that someone had tried to break in. Already we have an inconsistency because if you thought she just went to school early Why are you ringing the other person that lives there saying oh somebody broke in? Those are two very very different scenarios Anyway, for some reason or another Rosemary's phone wasn't working that day So unfortunately she was totally oblivious to the situation blissfully unaware to be honest because she was having a great time at the casino She actually won six grand that day, but regardless Charles when he couldn't get through, he headed off to work, like it was any other day. So Rosemary only found out about all this when she arrived home later that day, and she also didn't think that much into the busted door. And her response was just to ask Charles to repair it. I, did the question, do we actually know where Yasmin is, come up at all? But it was around 5pm then that Rosemary remembered actually on Wednesdays, Yasmin gets home early from school and it was a Wednesday. So at this point, she should have been home hours ago. And that's when Rosemary started to worry. When there was still no sign of Yasmin at about 5.30, she called 911. But the police were taking ages to arrive, so Rosemary actually had to call them a number of times to get anybody to come to the house. In fact, it took a whole hour and a half for police to get there, because they arrived at 7.04 p.m. And if you are an avid true crime viewer, you know exactly what I'm gonna say next you know exactly what they immediately labelled it as. They considered it a runaway, despite the state of the door, despite the fact that her glasses that she needed to see properly were still in her room, despite the fact that nothing was missing. And what about money? What about her phone? What, like, did they even look into these things? Honestly, it doesn't seem like they did. They didn't take any evidence of hers. In fact, they didn't even look for it. They didn't dust for fingerprints. They didn't check for any DNA anywhere. And it actually took two whole days before they even took the padlock. And even at that, Rosemary had to call them a number of times over those few days just for them to take something for evidence. And also, Charles had already repaired the padlock. So that probably destroyed any of the evidence that was on it. Nobody living in the building, either currently or previously, was even questioned. Remember, there would have been tenants living in the upstairs apartment. But finally though, they got a very interesting lead. Some of Yasmin's school friends spoke to the police and they told them that actually Yasmin was planning on running away. And not only that, but she had called them after she left to tell them that she had run away. This is gonna anger some of you. <laughs> it definitely angered me. This was a total lie because the police looked into the phone records and there was no evidence that Yasmin had called any of them after she had disappeared. And eventually these school friends admitted that, yeah, they, they made it up. Why? Why would they do that? These police already believe that she ran away and you're just confirming that and we know that it doesn't really look like a runaway. <sighs> yeah, I guess sometimes kids don't know any better. Well, they would have been teenagers, like, I don't know. They really should have known better. Oh God, I don't, I, that is very irritating. Needless to say, Yasmin's family were very against this runaway theory as well. Like, she was in a good place. She was getting ready to start her very first job. She had a trip coming up with the local YMCA and all of this she was really excited about. So it just wouldn't make sense for her to just tap out. They believed from the word go that she had been kidnapped. The family must have done a pretty good job of getting the word out because there were quite a lot of reported sightings coming in of Yasmin, both locally as well as in places like New York City and Michigan, but none of these ended up actually being her. So the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months and there was still absolutely no sign or no word from Yasmin and not really much happening in the ways of the investigation. So on the first anniversary of Yasmin's disappearance, Rosemary and the family held a press conference where they let people know that the police had spent very little time and energy on Yasmin's case. Also around this time, this is where things get incredibly interesting. Also around this time, Rosemary 
She was watching TV and she saw that this 38 year old man had been arrested and charged with multiple sexual assaults. They were committed between 2006 and 2009, not too far from her home, but she actually recognized this man and she knew a little bit about him too. You are actually not gonna believe what I'm about to say. This man had lived in the two flat, in the same building as Yasmin, shortly before she disappeared. <sighs> and there's more to this too, so just you wait. Firstly though, before I get into that, Rosemary went to the police with this information saying, oh, by the way, that guy used to live in my house shortly before Yasna disappeared. And she says that she didn't come forward straight away because she didn't want to point fingers and risk falsely accusing someone. <sighs> I'm just gonna say something here. Please point your fingers. Like, okay, I, I get it. Sometimes it's not relevant. Sometimes you do risk the person being very innocent. But when I tell you what she already knew about this man, you are going to scream. And she only finally alerted police of this because he was on the news basically being arrested and charged for various kidnapping and rape charges. So <laughs> who was this guy? So his name was Jimmy Terrell Smith and he was 35 years old at the time. And he, when he was living in the two flat, had already served 10 years in prison for attempted murder. A little bit about his background, his father was also an ex-convict and Jimmy had been raised by his grandmother because his drug addicted mother abandoned him. As a juvenile, he was repeatedly locked up for burglary, car theft and other crimes. It was in 2005 when he moved to the two flat after he'd been paroled and in between being paroled that time and when Yasmin disappeared, he had been arrested six other times. He was always armed and he sold drugs near the home. Okay, so before we get into the links to Yasmin, I'm just gonna talk a bit about the years following Yasmin's disappearance because there is some very important stuff that you need to know first. In 2009, he kidnapped four women, ages 22, 21, and two of them were only 14. He kidnapped them at gunpoint. He held them all in an old garage for two days, repeatedly sexually assaulting them and making them use the floor as a bathroom. One of them is still taunted, I don't know if it's to this day, but at least a couple of years ago, with calls and letters from Jimmy in prison. She also suffers with fear of men, fear of the dark and fear of being alone. So originally Jimmy was sentenced to 120 years in prison, but they knocked 10 years off it because he apparently showed genuine remorse by not forcing his victims to testify in court. A, not that those 10 years matter because he's gonna be in prison for the rest of his life anyway. And B, I don't know if that is good enough to reward him with anything. Like when you think about just how bad his crimes actually were, like, why are we even bothering to reward someone like that? I just don't think he deserves it. Anyway, I don't know, let me know what you think about that. He had also been charged with attacking prison guards and stabbing his public defender in the face and neck with a shank. So something that is not necessarily crucial for this case, but I just found interesting and kind of funny, is while he was in prison, he started to film a talk show on a contraband laptop. When this female prison guard went to go and take this laptop off him, he punched her in the face. But moving on to October 2019, Jimmy Terrell Smith was found guilty of hiring a hitman to kill the judge and prosecutor that originally handled his case. Luckily, this plan fell through, but my God, <laughs> this guy. Okay, so now finally, you have a pretty good understanding of the type of person Jimmy Terrell Smith was the kind of things that he was actually capable of doing. So now let's bring it back to 2007, 2008 and the links to Yasmin Akri. Because it was more than just him living there. I'll tell you that for a fact. But he would pay a lot of attention to Yasmin, both while he lived there and after he moved out, including at a family friend's house before she vanished. The kind of attention he would pay her, like he would stroke her hair on occasion, one time he gave her a beer and he told her that she looked like the actress Stacey Dash, who by the way, also modeled for Playboy. I don't know if he compared her to Yasmin because Stacey Dash is a genuinely beautiful woman or if it's because Stacey Dash is a sex icon. It's pretty worrying if it's the second one and I kind of have a gut feeling on which it was. Okay, so Yasmin also kept a diary while she was living in the two flat and this diary held a good few potential answers of what 
might have happened to her. Actually, before I even get into the details on the diary, this diary was not taken by police until 2011, three years after she disappeared. So she wrote about her assignments in school and essays she'd written. She also wrote about her favorite singers and stuff like that. But there were also some more disturbing themes in there as well. For example, she wrote about a relative's alleged cocaine use, as well as brawls in the schoolyard, as well as a young teenage cousin who had essentially boasted about her sex life. She also said, I have so many worries and so little time. I don't think there's anyone who understands how I feel. I wonder what she meant about so little time, actually. But of course, on top of that, she did mention Jimmy Terrell Smith. In fact, she said she missed him. And she also said that she missed his sexy ass. So. I don't know about you, but that kind of rings alarm bells in my head saying maybe he was grooming her for quite a while to the point where he built up this trust and rapport with Yasmin where she quite liked him and she enjoyed the attention and maybe affection that he was giving her. And unfortunately, yeah, Yasmin probably would have been a relatively easy target for this kind of thing because she wasn't getting that fulfilling love, affection and attention from anyone else in her life and she never really had. Also, I just want to bring us back to what I said about Jimmy Terrell Smith's mother. His drug addicted mother passed him on to his grandmother because she couldn't take care of him. And I just wonder if he and Yasmin bonded over that maybe because her drug addicted mother passed her on to, okay, yeah, the foster care system first, but then on to another relative because she couldn't take care of, of her and Demarcus. The next thing that comes to mind is, yeah, we have to question this guy. So finally, police and reporters questioned Jimmy Terrell Smith, and he actually ended up saying that he knew what happened to Yasmin, but that he wouldn't elaborate on that. And even though he was questioned for 30 plus hours, he didn't give any answers on that. Although he did admit to the fact that he was responsible for three or four uncharged homicides. And I say three or four because I've seen it said where he said three and then I've also seen it said where he said four. So I don't know, three or four, either way, bad situation, bad guy. Jimmy was also able to give the authorities details about the clothes and jewelry that Yasmin was wearing when she disappeared. So finally then police obtained a warrant and searched his house. But like you have to realize that at this point, he was in jail, he didn't even live there anymore, and the girlfriend that he had been living there with didn't live there anymore, so the house was empty, and three years had passed since Yasmin disappeared. However, police still took pictures and left with four evidence bags. Then in August of 2013, Jimmy Terrell Smith reached out to Rose May and her cousin and asked if they could meet up and talk. So of course, they did so. Initially, he denied everything, but then he ended up saying that he did take Yasmin, but he didn't kill her. He took her to a house in the 2200 block of South Spalding and he claims that when they got into the house, Yasmin killed herself and he disposed of her body by burning it. <sighs> but like, as far as I'm aware, that was the extent of the details he gave. Like, did he tell Yasmin that they were gonna run away together? And was she happy to go with him or was she terrified? Did she know about it beforehand? And look, I'm just gonna put a little warning here. I'm gonna discuss the suicide theory just for a quick minute. So feel free to skip this if it is a difficult topic because I will be asking some deeper kind of questions about it. So just, just so you know. Did he try to assault her and then there was an altercation that ended up in her killing herself? How did she do it? Did she reach for his gun? Because he was always armed. Did she grab a kitchen knife? Did she find some of the drugs that he'd been dealing and take an overdose? Was he in the room when this happened? Could he have stopped it? Like, unless it was a gun or a knife situation, it could have taken a bit of time. You know, he could have knocked the pills out of her hand or just how did this happen? It just doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And that's why I have so many questions. If he had provided more details, maybe it would make sense. And at least as far as I've seen, there haven't been any more details of, of that nature. And also not just how did she do it, but why? Was it because she believed she was gonna be assaulted again? I mean, that could have been a very triggering issue for her because of the abuse she had suffered as a child or was it because she was just sick of her difficult life or did she do it accidentally like these are only a small portion of the questions that I have because it just it just does not make sense and naturally Rosemary and the family didn't believe this story either what they believed now was that Jimmy Terrell Smith 
kidnapped Yasmin and took her to this house to sexually assault and kill her. And I definitely think that there's something to that. But despite all of this, he has never been charged with anything in relation to Yasmin's disappearance. It's apparently seen as hearsay. Also, if it was actually him that was responsible, like, come on, dude. You're already serving a 110 year sentence. You're in jail for the rest of your life. So come on, like, just admit it. At least give this family some closure and answers. And even if, you know what? Even if his actual story is true, that they got to this house and Yasmin killed herself, at least give the details. Where is the remnants of her body? Like, surely there's a way for this family to get answers. Anyway, looking at this case as a whole, the fact that it literally took a year and a half for the police to even realize that an ex-convict, ex-convict for attempted murder, by the way, had been living in the same house as Yasmin until shortly before she disappeared. <sighs> I mean, they clearly didn't look into previous tenants at all. And yeah, you could argue that, well, Rose May didn't tell them about it for that long either, so that's pretty bad too. It could have come about much quicker if they had just asked the question, who had been living here in the last few years? So simple. And the fact that the police never realized a criminal, like a sick criminal, not just petty theft or anything, had been living in the exact same building and had shown a little too much attention to Yasmin before she went missing, just demonstrates how little they actually cared about this girl and this case. I just wanna bang my head off a table right now, don't you? Obviously, no body has been found, but there have been a number of Jane Doe cases in Chicago over the years that could potentially be Yasmin. All right, let's have a quick run through of all the theories just so we can kind of refresh because I know there has been a lot of information and the timeline is a little bit all over the place. And yes, I know there is one theory that is particularly strong, <laughs> but this case is still technically unsolved. So that alone means that any one of these theories could be the actual truth of what happened to Yasmin Akri. Okay, so theory number one, Charles Burt. Firstly, Rosemary had gotten an order of protection against Charles Burt, who was her boyfriend, because he allegedly hit her. So he did have this potential violent streak. Also, there were some really strange inconsistencies in his movements on the day that Yasmin disappeared. Like, why assume that she just went to school? And then when you ring Rosemary, why be trying to tell her? that someone broke in. Again, like I said before, those are two very different scenarios. But then if he was responsible, he would have had to break into the scissor door and break into her bedroom himself, even though he could have just gone downstairs to get her. So that is kind of weird. However, maybe he broke the lock on purpose so that it would look like it was somebody else and that someone broke in. That's definitely plausible. But then why would you just assume that she went to school? I don't know, I, it, it's, uh, it's weird either way, honestly. Okay, next theory is that Rose May had something to do with it. Did she actually go to the casino in Elgin, Illinois? Do we have CCTV footage of her there? I would love to know. <laughs> Does her daughter vouch for the fact that they spent time together that day? Because let's be honest, Rose May didn't want the kids and Demarcus was already gone, and now Yasmin was the only one stinting her freedom. But then, if she was involved, wouldn't she have wanted to point the finger at Jimmy Terrell Smith sooner to get the heat off her? But then, you could also argue that maybe if she did do that, it would look like she's trying to get the heat off her, so maybe it was just safer to say nothing. I don't know, this is all feeling very Among us -y. <laughs> But Rose May left an ex-convict and her potentially violent and abusive boyfriend alone with Yasmin. So from that perspective, she could be considered indirectly responsible for Yasmin's disappearance either way. And I don't know how she felt over the years guilt-wise. That would be interesting to know, I reckon. Okay, the third theory is that Rosemary and Charles Burt were in it together. This would be for similar reasons that I've just mentioned. Like their story is a little strange, but then in contrast to that, you have to also remember that Rosemary was the one that kept contacting the police, kept pushing them to investigate more, that kept saying, no, no, this wasn't a runaway. She was taken. She also held several vigils for Yasmin over the years. But then on the other side, was that all an act? 
uh, I don't know, I don't want to be disrespectful either because if she is innocent then my heart like goes out to her and I can't imagine how awful that is. I feel like I say that all the time but like truly but you do kind of have to go there don't you okay the next theory is the runaway theory we have to go there too i don't really want to go there but we have to at this point in yasmin's life she might have finally kind of had the the balls to just get away from all of this awful stuff that was happening she was starting to see her life become more fulfilling trips and you know like she was starting to experience life more so maybe that just showed her hey life can actually be pretty good i don't deserve to deal with the abuse and being locked in a basement and being hit if i say something that doesn't please rose may or you know what i mean like she could have finally been like okay it's time but why was the door busted up i mean yeah she she might have literally escaped through that door so that she didn't have to wake anyone else in the house. How did she get her hands on bolt cutters? If she did get bolt cutters, they weren't found, or at least I haven't heard anything about them being found. So did she take them with her? Did she dispose of them somewhere? Also, there was nothing missing from her room. So like, surely you would need some stuff, like you, you, you would need some stuff to survive. And she didn't have great eyesight and her glasses were left behind. Maybe the fact that DeMarcus had left was the final straw. Like, yes, she had been through a lot in her upbringing, but like as a child, you kind of just accept that that is your reality. You generally don't question things that deeply as a child, but I don't know. And I mean, if she did run away, maybe she's out there somewhere. Okay, the final theory is, of course, Jimmy Terrell Smith, that he had something to do with her disappearance. And again, there are two prongs to this theory. So the first one is that she took her own life after Jimmy Terrell Smith kidnapped her. So obviously I've already asked a number of the questions that I would have around the suicide aspect of this theory. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless there's more to it that we don't know yet. And you know, with any unsolved case, it's only unsolved because there is missing information that we don't know yet. So do with that what you will. But the other side of this theory, probably the more believable side of this theory, in my opinion anyway, is that Jimmy Terrell Smith kidnapped her and killed her. This just seems a lot more believable considering his criminal history, considering the fascination he seemed to have with Yasmin and the potential of him grooming her. Like, the kind of things that she was writing in her diary about him, like she she seemed to quite like him too. So he probably was showing her some kind of positive attention. Oh, also, I didn't even mention this, but during a conversation with Rose May, he also described what Yasmin's room looked like. And he hadn't been in there before, or well, at least we don't know if he had been in there before. If he had been in there before, that just adds to the theory anyway, because what was he doing in her room? Do you know what I mean? Anyway, there, there's a lot of food for thought there. So I would love to know which theory you're leaning towards the most. Also, if Yasmin Akri is out there somewhere and she's alive, she would be 28 now. And if she is out there, I just hope, I just hope that she's all good. When she went missing, she was 15 years old, five foot one and about 125 pounds. I mean, I'm sure those measurements would have changed at this point, but who knows? Anyway, it's, it's important to mention just in case. Obviously, if there ever happened to be any updates on this case, I'll let you know. Surely there's something else that the police can do to get more information about the whole Jimmy Terrell Smith thing. Like surely there's something else that can be done so again if there are any updates i'll let you guys know either in the comments here or on my tiktok instagram or twitter all of which are kate philpot underscore yt and thank you so so much for watching this video if you enjoyed it please leave a like and comment down below what your thoughts were doing that really helps me out with the algorithm so if you don't mind again i'm still not quite ready to be back to regular scheduling even though it's literally the end of March. <laughs> We're just waiting on some things to happen. It'll happen. I, I don't know when, but it'll happen. <laughs> I'll let you know anyway. But yeah, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys. Sammy, you are not barking right now. I won't have it. And it was the following morning then. A man just walked past the window. <laughs>
padlock had been not me literally trying to put as much of my dressing gown on as I can without it being in the <laughs> in the camera. <laughs> I'm cold. And this, so at, at this. <gasps> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow was dinner. Should we do that? Oh yeah. 